Lisa has been a spiritual daughter to Steve and Renee, I think the longest out of everyone who moved down here to Texas. She has been so faithful in the heart of the Lord. She got radically saved. Guys, she was a mess. She was a big, hot mess before she knew Jesus. She told me the crazy story. We were roommates for a little bit. She told me some of the crazy stories, and I'm like, you did what now? And she's like, but Jesus is so good, and he redeems all of that. And now I have a heart, too. Da, 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 da. So, we, guys, you are in for such a special treat this morning, hearing from the depth of wisdom and revelation. You really have carry heavenly revelation and crazy street smarts as well that you get to release to us today. So, um, Jesus, I just bless my sister. I thank you for who she is in the spirit. I thank you that she's full of your fire and your power. And let that word just come out in glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Um, and Abba, help me release all the tools I need to release to people today. Supernatural grace, God, to unlock keys and hope and empowerment to everyone to just know that he's with you wherever you go. It's so funny that she told you all my business because I'm about to talk about everybody else's business. So it's just, you know, what is it? You reap what you sow, but I didn't sow it yet. You know, I don't know. Um, and I'm, what was I had something else completely on my heart. I think I'll talk about another time, talking about submission and authority and how those things go together. You know, the more we say yes to God, the more he backs us up, things like that. But then God turned me in another direction to talk and share stories about the marketplace um, and just give you kind of hope and keys for loving people wherever you go. But I have, a, I have some stories first. And I also, if you haven't heard me speak yet, I like to push a lot on religious mindsets um, in the Bible Belt. Not because I hate the Bible Belt. I love, I love the established righteousness in the South. I think it's beautiful. I think it's powerful. Um, but I think there's some ideas and mindsets that lock people up from the fullness. And so I'm kind of after that. You know? All right. Yeah, so now I'm about to tell you everybody else's business. Here, here's how it goes. No, I, so the other day I was talking to my mom, and uh, I had an auntie, so I was raised Catholic. I was adopted and raised Catholic, and I had an auntie. All I remember about her, she'd be like a great aunt, is that she was sweet and she smiled a lot. But as I got older, they told me that she had wanted to be a nun, and they kicked her out. And I was like, What? How, what? And I was like, why? Why'd they kick her out? Well, I'm not entirely surprised, but I thought she would have gotten caught, kicked out for saying something sassy because my family's very sassy, but that wasn't it. Apparently, she was sickly, and she brought in alcohol. <laughs> I don't know why she thought that was a good idea, but I don't know. Maybe she just didn't know. So in my mind, I'm like, okay, well, why don't you heal her and maybe just, you know, drive whatever other thing was out in her and, you know, you got a whole lineup of nuns. You can't take this one, <laughs> you know? I loved her. She, I just always thought of her as this sweet aunt. So when I was like, she got what? So, but what it reminded me of, so she went on actually to be a teacher. And then she was the one who introduced my mom and dad. And it was so funny because my mom is really stubborn. And it took her two years to say yes to my auntie introducing the two of them. And, uh, my parents went on to, they couldn't have kids, so they adopted. So they adopted me, who was potentially going to be aborted. And they adopted my baby brother, whose mama tried to starve him out in the womb. And then they spent their lives faithfully serving to raise us up. Talk about change the world, right? Yeah. Deep stuff. So, but what it reminded me of, especially in the Bible Belt, belt in a ministry culture, a lot of times people are like, I'm going to be in ministry. I'm going to be in ministry. There's nothing wrong with that. If God has called you to that, do it. Awesome. Be empowered with might to do it, to do it well. But being in a position of ministry is not always the effective, the most effective position to affect people's lives. And that's what my auntie kind of reminds me of. I'm like, she was so sweet. I loved her. If I had known as a child what she'd been through, I probably would have loved her more. I'd be like, auntie, they kick you out. Hey, be my friend, you know? Because... It wouldn't, as a teenager running into a lot of trouble, I wouldn't have respected a nun, sorry, but I would have respected someone who's been through stuff, you know? Yeah. So sometimes, like, so I had been saved, radically saved, and then I was working at a church for about six years, and God took a season to just kind of insulate me. I was surrounded by church people. They were amazing, um, very evangelistic, and they loved me really well. 
But after a season when God moved me out, I was kind of like, oh, I never want to work for a church again. And not because they were in sin or they did anything wrong, but I would watch these cycles in people, right? So I'd be, you know, at the front desk watching people come in and go, and I would watch the lady pastor, and she would be like, she'd be like, I just don't know. I keep trying to get this person through breakthrough, and it's just they keep staying in the same cycle. And I remember watching all of it and thinking, I don't know, but from here, it looks like they're telling you about half the story, you know? They went in there and like, they did this, they did this, they did this, and it looks like they didn't tell you what they did because they're not having no breakthrough. And I was like, oh, man, you know, if you were a bartender or a barber, they probably would have told you the whole story, and you would have had access to speak directly to their heart. And if someone is not, so I'm not trying to hate on, there's all kinds of reasons why people don't tell everything. So you, don't, you don't tell people things you don't trust. That's fine. But I was watching her as a pastor struggle, and I was like, ugh, that looks like the roughest job. I would much rather be in a place where I could be talking to people about something real so we could get somewhere with it. You know, tell me your real business, and I'll, I'll give you what I actually have. But so I would just watch her struggle. And after a while, um, that lady pastor kind of burned out, I think because of that kind of thing. You know, people are just stay in these loops. And so I go from there, and after that, I started coaching sports, and I felt like God told me to become a lifeguard. I was kind of like, I never want to sit behind a desk again. I want to be running around out with people, so I became a lifeguard, and I was like, I don't know how this makes sense. I'm in my 30s, and I'm a lifeguard. Like, <laughs> I don't know, but okay, God, I'll do that. So I was out as a lifeguard with all these young people, because it's all young people who are lifeguards, and there was a young woman who I was working with, and she uh, starts telling me about her life, and she had been from California, and then she met this guy, ran off with the guy, turns out he's abusive, and now she's in Wisconsin. That's how you know it's not the Lord. If you wind up in Wisconsin and it's cold, it wasn't Jesus. He's, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. They have good cheese curds. I don't know. Um, but I remember her telling, and all of her friends at the time were telling her, well, just this other guy likes you, run off with the other guy. And I was watching all this happen, and I was like, oh, my goodness. And I was like, Lord, what on earth? And he was like, here's what it is. This is what God told me. Young people lack wisdom, and they're going to take advice for, with, from whoever's around them. So if no one's there, if none of us are present who know God to say, hey, do something else, they're going to do what's present. You know, we know we escape so much trouble by the wisdom God gives us. And people who don't know God don't have that. So they're not held to the same standard, nor do they have the ability to obey. And especially not if none of us are there saying anything, right? So I want to say to this young woman, I'm like, hey, that's, that's not the only other option, you know? And I kind of tried to steer her. I tried to, um, and I wasn't trying per se. I thought she was the coolest ever, you know, this like server chick. I just thought she was so cool. And I, so I would just be nice to her, and I would speak life over her, and I'd kind of point at the things in her that I saw were good, and I'd poke at them. I'm like, man, you're amazing. You know, I don't think that's your only option, like, you know, and try to speak some life. That really works in the workplace. Just so you know, people do not, there's so much muck and abuse and things going on. If people have not been shown, covered, loved, or taught that they're valuable, they don't act like it. They go get what they were taught to get. So a lot of times what I see people stumbling through in the world is common. Like Jesus said, you, you're only struggling that with that which is common to man, and that's what I see in most people. And maybe that sin sounds extravagant or shocking or something, but it's actually common today. So we know better because God taught us, because God's empowering us, and he actually, by his Holy Spirit, empowers us to obey, which protects our lives and prospers us and gives us peace and gives us wisdom, and the people in the world right now don't have that. Since COVID was released, there was so much fear put on people. There's so much stress. Anyone who doesn't have God who's looking at the world right now, like, I don't know, it looks like everything's about to break between all the political unrest and things going on in the world. So they're taking all that pressure that's coming, and they're doing with it what they know how to do. How can I medicate to get out from this sound and get a little bit of peace and be able to sleep at night? That's where they're at, you know? Most people, I find, are not in a place where they hate God and they're just trying to run from him. Most people are doing what they know how to do. So what I found and what God was showing me is that all he wanted me to do was be in the midst of young people and start speaking life. Like, you're amazing, 
You have another option. You're valuable. And God, because he has taught us value, and then he, the whole prophetic movement is words of life, right? It's the testimony of Jesus, the life, the hope that we have. And I don't, like... I'll give you another workplace story. So this one is more recent. There's a, now I'm in the world of aviation and aviation has all kinds of things going on in the industry. It's, it's a little bit overwhelming, but of the things, there's a lot of, there was a young woman, she was working with a captain and uh, she's in a place where she's got a lot of debt. She's trying to get to the next level in her career. So he takes her out for drinks and he hits on her. She gets out of the situation, and she comes back, and she tells me about it, and she essentially says, well, I'm pretty sure I'm going to have to flirt with this guy to get my job. I need a job. And at the time, I was a little like, my life is so busy, so I was just listening to her. And then I was in worship last week, and God was like, I want you to text her, call her, and you let her know she doesn't have to do it that way, right? So instead of being like, the Bible says you shouldn't do that. No, you shouldn't do that. That's not the way to get a job. That's old profession, you know? <laughs> like, no, I don't do that to anybody because they ain't read the Bible. How are they going to know? So what I said to her was like, hey, you know, you don't have to do anything you're not comfortable with. There's plenty of opportunities. You're an amazing pilot. There's another door that's going to open. You don't have to function in that system, even though there's quite a bit of pressure to function in that system. I've missed opportunities because I won't function in that system, you know? It's just, it's just the industry. So, and she was like, thank you so much. You know, and she kind of straightened the guy out and all of that was good. But while that sounds very scandalous, it's really common for the industry. It's almost, we it's weird, it's countercultural that I would have said anything against it. And so as believers, what I'd love to give you the tools to do is get to the heart of the word. If God tells me not to flirt to get a job or use what my mama gave me to get a job, it's, it's not because he wants to slow down my career moves. It's because he knows that that seed of some deception is going to birth something I don't really want. I don't really want the fruit of that action, right? I don't really want to live in a gamey, seductive world. I just, ugh, right? But most of, most of the young people walking through it, especially women because of the pressure against them, they kind of go somewhere along that route. But how are they supposed to know not to when we're not there to say anything? So again, like my auntie, for whatever her reasons where she wanted to be a nun, I think that's awesome. I have so many questions, you know. Um, it wouldn't have put her in proximity to young people. And it wouldn't have put her, she probably, I don't know if she would have been able to hook up my mom and my dad or if that would have even been on her radar, you know what I mean? So, so for us, sometimes people will get the I want to be in ministry thing in their head. And I think the reason why God's trying to dissolve that is because there's a much more effective ministry that we have present around us every day. Just by loving and speaking life to people who do not, who would never tell a pastor the truth about their lives because they would feel ashamed or hurt or scared at what that person could say or do to their lives. So we don't want to be that. We want to stand for righteousness, but all of the rules in the Bible are for us. They're for us, they're for us to walk in strength and victory and take ground everywhere we go. When we're looking out at the world and broken people who haven't received Jesus yet, those rules just aren't for them. But the heart of God to protect us is what we want to share with them. Like, hey girl, you don't have to do that. You're so valuable. There's another opportunity for you. You don't ever have to feel uncomfortable. You know, it isn't choose this sin or that sin. What, what is that phrase like? Better or worse, evil, so I don't know. I've heard, yeah, the lesser of two evils. That's not the, those are not our only options in the kingdom of God. But God has given us revelation to see that. So as older people, I've gotten older, my challenge to us and my encouragement to us and my empowerment to us is the most effective thing we can do is walk with people. Just walk with them. Be present when they're having that really bad day. And don't be scared or scandalized by anything somebody tells you. It is just what is common to man. And God is surely not surprised. So don't be surprised. Instead, look at people and look for the life inside of them and point at it. And then keep pointing at it. So that person knows wherever they go in their world for how much trouble and whatever's causing them to be that way, if they come back to you, they know they'll be loved. They know they'll be blessed. And then speak the truth, but speak the truth in love. Yeah. 
So workplace, marketplace. So I just want to, like sometimes also with people, and I'm really after the honesty thing, being honest with ourselves, being honest with God, because I'll watch people get confused somewhere between like this electric moment with God, which I love electric moments with God. Like I want to live in that place and not come back. But this electric moment with God and everything he says and all those promises he gives, and then I watch people and it's like they don't know how to let that revelation come down into their mind to renew their mind, come into their heart to soften their heart, come into their soul to realign it with God all the way down to their walk. And I don't think it's because people want to be hypocrites. I think it's because there's misunderstanding. That's a whole process of renewal. Renee will talk about that a lot, that, that people have a process of letting God in deeper and deeper and deeper places. And this is for us, us who are called to take ground. It's for us who are called to be out in the world and not of the world. But I'll watch people get disappointed. God says I'm going to be, you know, a jet pilot and I'm going to be this and that. Like, I got, I got words like that before I knew how to land an airplane. And I was like, please, land a, land a plane. You want to go home to Jesus now? I'm not going to want to, you know. But it took a completely different thing to understand how to let all of that manifest. And God's priorities in my life were a lot different than that to establish it. He stretched me out a lot. He stretched me out a lot before we were doing really, really cool things. For a long time, it just felt like a lot of pressing. And then taking that pressing into the presence of God is what birthed a completely different kind of authority. And to be honest, a much deeper love for God. Because I can't believe what he saved me from. I couldn't believe what he saved me from before with like alcohol and drugs. Now I can't believe what he saved me from flying with students. Like, oh my goodness, it's the same place. It's just as dangerous, but now you're louder, you know? So so figuring out how to, and it's not even a figuring, it's a walking with him and realizing that electric, amazing dream is really important, that destiny call and cry that's for us, and then we multiply that for everybody else. When you're speaking life, you're speaking those seeds of destiny in them, right? But it takes a little bit to know how to walk with the Father for that to come all the way through us and down into our walk. And Renee will say she sees people like it's a sincere process. So where I see people stuck sometimes is either their expectations are just a little off, like, ah, God said this big thing, so I always have to say the right thing, you know, when it's all on them to try to be perfect enough to make it manifest. But what what I think the issue actually is, is being really honest with ourselves and really honest with God. Like, God, I'm scared. I don't want to die in a plane, God. <laughs> I'm scared. Help me. Help me be with me right now. You know? And it's in that place of relationship where I cry out for help, and he responds. And I cry out for help, and he responds. And I tell him, I don't think it's going to work, and he responds. And then I'm like, oh, my gosh, we had victory. That's amazing. Thank you, God. He responds. And this relationship we have in walking out, taking ground gets deeper and deeper and deeper. There was one day I was, uh, I've been doing this for a while. Sometimes in my world, between all of the people that I care about that don't know Jesus very well yet, to everything my industry has going on in it, to how much I care about all God's doing with all of us, sometimes I'll be driving in my car, and I'll do this in planes too, and I'll just take my hand and I'll put it like this in the other seat, like I'm holding God's hand, because I don't, I, I'm out of words. I just, I'm just like, help me, so like hold my hand. And one day, I would, I've been doing that for years, just as a like, not a trauma response, but like sometimes, you know, like, Jesus help me. Like, I don't even have words for today, Jesus. And there was one day, not that long ago, where I was doing that, and you know how you have things in your life? I'm like, I understand this is symbolic. I'm holding Jesus's hand on the way to work, or whatever, and For some reason, I picked up my hand and I set it on my other hand on my steering wheel and my hand was so hot, it like almost burned. And I was like, and if you have ever been around people who pray for healing and stuff, um, when our hands get hot, it can be a symbol that the Holy Spirit is like ready to heal people like right now. And it wasn't hot like when you have your hands closed and it wasn't a hot summer day. It was It was like supernatural and it actually scared me because all these years I've been like, okay, this is me symbolizing, telling God I just need him. I need him and I don't know how to ask for what I need. And then when he did that, I was like, oh, you've been holding my hand for years. This is crazy, crazy, you know, because all of all of those days of 
You take a little ground. Today you feel confident. You crushed it. There was victory. Next day, ooh, there was warfare. And on and on and on it goes. So there's, there's a process of daily life that God really likes. And the more honest we are, the easier it is for him to draw near and stabilize our walk. That's a whole process for us who, who love more of God and don't always know how to do all of it. That's just, that's just real. But there's a way. There is a way in relationship with him where he establishes what is important to him. And then he dissolves everything that's not important to him. Yeah. So um, if you've ever had, uh, heard me tell stories before, I've talked a lot about ministry in the workplace. I really love it. I think it's awesome. I really love getting to know people in the workplace and um, hearing their real life stories. And then I listen for Holy Spirit to see what he's highlighting. And then I just speak to that. It's usually speaking to their value. It's usually speaking their, to their design. And I love it. But every once in a while, even though I've done this a bunch, I still get intimidated um, because of spiritual warfare in the marketplace. So there's um, a friend of mine who's an amazing pilot, and I was praying for him for his salvation, and God gave me a picture. This is in the lines of spiritual warfare. And the picture that he gave me was my friend sitting in the back of a, a business jet, which is his work, and there was a demon sitting across from him. It was like this Egyptian god thing with that dog's head. That thing was sitting there talking to him. And when I was praying, I was like, ooh. And it, but it did make sense because a lot of times I'll go to this friend. He's excellent, excellent in his industry. But he'll often give me advice that's just a little. It's correct for the industry, but it's not correct for the way God has led me. Right? So there's been times where I'm like, man, I, I want to be this guy someday because he's such a good pilot. Um, and he can do anything, you know, how your heroes get in your mind. Um, but when God showed me that, I was like, huh, okay, so I'm going to weigh that advice in a way, because that's kind of what God was saying. Like, for example, one of the uh, advice, pieces of advice he gave me, he was like, I don't know why you're trying to do all this church stuff while doing all this aviation stuff. You should just, like, stop doing church stuff, focus on aviation, and then when you're done with that, you'll have money, and then you can help the church. <laughs> Which I was like, Jesus? <laughs> nope. We're not doing it that way. We're not separating you from the people of God to try to, you know, there's a lot of ways to go off, right? So I take both his advice, took his advice on other things. But when I prayed for him and I saw that demon, I was like, okay, that makes a lot of sense, actually. So on the earth, and I'm not going to dig too deep into this, but I want to just touch on it. There are groups of people who are into things that are super evil, and it's systemic, it's strategic, and it's disturbingly, you know, very, very uh, end of the book, end of the Bible, biblical kind of stuff. There's groups of people out there doing those things. In that, there are, there are companies making money that are in alignment with that thing, doing these strategic things on the earth. The company I currently work for is one of those companies. My company is also the banner company over my friend. So I walk into work, you know, I'm so grateful I have a new job, I'm learning a new thing in aviation. It's beautiful. God opened the door. Yeah. I walk into my job and there is a statue of that demon sitting in my office. We have this big bullpen of offices and there's that little. And I was like, <gasps> I knew the company that I worked for. I knew they were into stuff, but now I was like, that's incredibly specific. Because that's the thing I saw talking to my friend who works for essentially the same banner company. And I was like, ooh. So it intimidated me. It intimidated me because I'd seen it before. I know what those people are into. And I was like, ugh. Jesus helped, so I went through a whole thing. I had a little, like, I don't want to leave my house. I went, through, I went through the whole thing. I went through Elijah in a cave, you know, like, I don't want to, you know. Maybe I can work from home. I don't know, you know. I'm so grown up in Christ, and I've overcome so much. <laughs> Elijah, what are you doing in the cave? The scary people out there. Um, and so it intimidated me. So I worked there for about six months, and I've seen that thing, and I've been, like, uh, and the spiritual warfare in my workplace is really interesting. It's really, really interesting. It's not like overt, in your face, raw. It's more like comes around the side. Yeah, I know, worse, much worse, right? Anyway, I don't want to glorify that, but when we're taking ground in the marketplace, ministering to people, there's a reality of spiritual warfare. It's not a Christian environment. They're not trying to be a Christian environment. So we're bringing the light. So I, wasn't, I was just intimidated. And not intimidated because of some stupid little statue, just intimidated by the bigger things they're into, right? 
But I had some breakthrough in the last week. Thank God. There's an older gentleman who has had cancer, and he's in chemo. He's an amazing, uh, he's an amazing uh, flight teacher, and he, he's really, really good at his job. And I've been wanting to pray for him a couple di- times, but my job was really busy. And obviously, then I was talking about the warfare in the atmosphere. So the other day, God gave me grace, and he came up. I was like, how are you doing? And he was talking about some of the effects of chemo. And I was like, well, I was like, hey, I was like, I go to a church where we like pray for people and then they get better. I was like, do you want me to pray for you? He's like, yeah, I'm like, okay, cool. And then I did just what we do up here. I was like, I put my hand on your shoulder and there I was five feet from a little demon statue praying over my friend. Yeah, yeah. Bringing healing into the workplace. And my workplace is an intellectual environment tied up with some of those strongholds. And so... I was intimidated by it, you know, but God is overthrowing that as well. And after I prayed for him, I was like, I don't know why I was intimidated for so long, you know, so it was kind of beautiful. It was really beautiful. And then it reminded me, you know, old, young, religious, not religious, crabby, not crabby. God wants to heal everybody. He wants to heal everybody. He wants everyone to know his kindness. He's no respecter of persons, but that means the good stuff too. He's no respecter of someone like having a job where they have to look all professional. He doesn't care. He still wants him to be, uh, he still wants his love to just go through all of that and get to people. And so I was humbled. I was humbled even as I was praying for this guy, like this guy should have felt better sooner because I didn't, I just didn't. But it's okay. I know God's not mad, right? And... See, I don't want to miss anything. I think sometimes it's that, and I love that Renee and Steve teach this. I love that Steve's like, raw faith. Ah! And I love that Renee is like, in the process, God is with you. Because they go together. They absolutely they go together to produce a whole person. A whole person who obeys God, not someone who's like, oh, when I show up here, I'm supposed to say the right thing. So that they know that I actually belong here. That's how you know I have membership. I say the right things. That's not, that's not the fullness of God. The fullness of God is those pieces of wisdom and revelation he gives us as we walk through the stuff, the real stuff. And then he equips us to go out into the world so the world can tell us their real stuff. And then we have the cure and we've got the insight and we've got the wisdom for them which is God's heart. He wants to extend that protection to others and save as many as possible as the whole world is shaking and breaking. And we have stability because of Christ. We've got that covering. We've got that source. We have a source of comfort, and he's the one who heals us in our anxieties and our pressures, and the world is doing something else because they don't have that covering and they don't have that comfort. So in your industries, kind of what I'd like to do today a couple of things. One, if God has called you to be in ministry, awesome. You want to be that nun? You go be that nun. You know, rock that little habit, whatever. It's not bad if God has called you into ministry. It's not bad. But the most effective position you could be in to change the world may not be that. And it's, I'm, I'm not giving no one be in ministry or leadership ever. That's not what I'm trying to say. But I'm try, I would like to push it, that mindset. Because there's a more effective place to love people and there's a more effective position to change the world. It does require obedience, just like that little nun habit would. (laughs) But you don't have to wear that. Hallelujah. Right? Although I'm wearing the black and white today, you know. And so I just wanted to impart that to each of us. One, don't be scared by the world like I was up to this week. (laughs) And... um, I give you permission to love people and you don't have to be like, the Bible says you shouldn't do that. But for us, that that is true. The Bible says you shouldn't do that. Here's why. Because it will hurt you and God has a way to bring life. But he's trying to share that with everyone. Um, Raleigh, would you come up and play keys for a little bit? When I was a lifeguard, which is incredibly prophetic, actually, because I do in life, I kind of feel like I'm the lifeguard of the deep end for people (laughs) in their lives, in their situations. Um, I was around so many young people. I had access to their lives. I had access to their stories and what they were really thinking about. 
And then sometimes I would come into a church setting or hear, pe hear people talk, and I would think, I wonder why they're really hammering that issue because I don't know anybody thinking about that. Not out in the world. You know, so we can wind up a little separate from the pulse on the ground. And it looks a certain way from back here, the way those messages are affecting a generation. But when we are in the world and not of the world, we start to actually sense and feel, how's that hitting people's hearts? And I would say over young people, I see that a lot of those pressures and fears have stopped them from the confidence and impulse to move forward in places. So I've had a couple of like Gen Zers where daily in the workplace, I'm like, hey, why don't you try this? You'd be good at that. Why don't you try this? And they just kind of look at me like a little dazed. Like it's almost like all those sounds over the past four or five years have kind of put them in this like haze where what looks clear to us because God has protected us, they can't see. So they kind of need us to be like, hey, you're, a, you're really brilliant. You'd be really good at this. And then you kind of start to push him forward a little bit. Like these sounds in the world, the enemy's trying to get people to do that, just get them to stop, give up hope, stagnate. But God's not doing that. And we can, we can sense and feel that by his power. He's really got a lot of life in people. He's got a lot of, he's got his own strategic in initiatives. He's pulling people together to manifest on the earth, just like the enemy is loudly doing. God is doing that as well. So we're, we're out into the world waking people up with effective ministry. That love that comes from heaven is an effective ministry. So if any of you, I just kind of want to pray some impartation kind of stuff. If there's anybody who wants more grace in their daily lives, wants more wisdom and revelation to love the people around them in their industry, in their families, would you just stand up? I want to pray for you. And then um, prayer teams, would you guys come up as well? And if you have any words. Um, I don't see. Yeah, let me pray for you guys. God, thank you so much for these people. Thank you so much for these people who love your Holy Spirit. I ask today that you would multiply the wisdom and revelation you gave me to do my daily life. To do my daily life. To see people. To see the gifts you poured out on them to help people who are, are blinded by wicked schemes to see a little piece of life, God. I pray for effective ministry and deep love from the Father's heart to fall on these people. Grace, 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 God. Give them grace for their daily. And even now, God, would you share that favor that you've given me in the marketplace to attract people and to have words for people and to love them and to minister healing, would you multiply that over these people? Grace, grace, Papa. Grace, grace, I thank you for these ones who are brave and pure in heart and love to see you move even in unlikely places. And even if anyone's got that thing like my auntie had, like she had to be this kind of thing to be good for you, I ask you to dissolve anything like that that's not from your heart. But for everyone truly called to ministry, teach them how, even in the unlikely ways, to really, to really manifest truth to the human heart. Grace, grace, Papa, grace, grace.